Hello and welcome to this MCA webinar on the evolution of Ethernet in motion control, presented to you by Galil Motion Control. This webinar will be recorded and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. The recording will be available for one year. If you have any questions on the presentation material, please feel free to submit your questions via the panel on the right and they will be answered as time permits or possibly after the webinar ends if time run out, runs out. I'm Kathleen Strait and I'm joined by our presenters today, Ann Kepper and Robin Riley with Galil Motion Control. Ann joined Galil in 2013 and is responsible for all aspects of marketing. Before joining Galil, Ann enjoyed a successful career in various engineering and marketing roles at Hewlett Packard where she gained broad management experience in marketing, business development, research, and development. Ann holds a bachelor's in computer science and a minor in mathematics from Chico State. Robin Riley joined Galil in 1999 after holding engineering roles at companies such, a, such as Raychem, Tyco, and EPE Industries, where his technical contribution focused on mechanical design. Robin began his career at Galil assisting new customers with the development of hardware and software for motion applications, as well as troubleshooting existing OEM's current machines. The past five years, Robin has become the senior application engineer, focusing mostly on international OEMs. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Maine at Orono. I would also like to thank our sponsors today. Electromate is the exclusive Canadian distributor for Galil and specializes in high-performance robotic and mechatronic systems, which include servo and stepper solutions, positioning actuators, and robots. Electromate's extensive product selection is backed up by just-in-time delivery and stocked inventory. Electromate also offers engineering assistance and technical support by our dedicated customer service team. I would also like to thank our other sponsor, Galil, with over 750,000 controllers sold, Galil is the leading manufacturer of motion controllers. Since their introduction of the first microprocessor-based motion controller in 1983, Galil has remained the industry's leading innovator. By offering their customers the most powerful, cost-effective, and easy-to-use motion controllers available today, their commitment is to be your primary source for any motion control application. Galil's unparalleled array of motion controllers is backed by superior technical support and can accommodate the most demanding applications with absolute precision. Thank you everyone for joining us. Okay, let's get started. Thank you everybody. My name's Ann. I'm here to uh, present the evolution of Ethernet and motion and I.O. control. I'll be presenting the introduction and overview and then I'll hand it over to Robin for the technical part of the presentation. So a little bit about the history of Ethernet. In 1973, a man named Robert Metcalf uh, worked at Xerox, and he came up with the idea of Ethernet. He was actually inspired by Aloha Net, which he studied for his PhD dissertation. Robert left Xerox in 1979 and started 3Com, which probably all of you know, because they were a really big networking company. Um, and they were actually acquired a few years ago by Hewlett Packard. Um, Ethernet became a formal standard in 1983 and was published as IEEE 802.3. It survived two huge competitors, Token Ring and Token Bus, but due to its ab ab ability to adapt, over the, um, adapt to the market and shift to inexpensive, ubiquitous wiring called Twisted Pair, it was able to survive. And since then, Ethernet has evolved to meet market requirements, specifically speed and reliability. Ethernet now connects not only computers, but appliances and personal devices as well as devices in control system environments. So this presentation will take you through the evolution of Ethernet and control systems, the protocols most viable and popular today, and what you might expect to see in the future. So first I'll tell you a little bit about Galil as a company and give you a brief overview of our motion controllers and PLCs. And then Robin will walk you down the Ethernet evolutionary path, starting with what happened before Ethernet, was viable in control systems. I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of proprietary architectures and why Ethernet is usually a better choice. I'll review the definition of determinism and non-determinism networks. 
um, and how they're relevant in control system architectures. I'll also discuss the advantages and disadvantages of many Ethernet protocols and show some real examples of control applications they're most suitable for. And then on to how we predict Ethernet will evolve into the future. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer questions. Um, any questions that we can't answer due to time, um, we'll, we'll, we'll answer them through email directly. So a little bit about Galil. Galil was founded in 1983 by Jacob Tao and Wayne Barron, who worked together at HP Labs, um, which is actually the think tank for Hewlett Packard. They had a similar problem they were trying to solve, which was how to use a digital microprocessor to manage an analog device. They took their idea outside of HP and started their own company called Galil Motion Control. Galil became the first company to introduce a microprocessor-based servo controller. At that time, they used an 8-bit microprocessor. Today, we use a 32-bit RISC-based microprocessor. So Galil has been developing and selling motion and I.O. controllers worldwide for over 30 years. We have an established reputation, history, track record, and manufacturing leading controllers that are intelligent and fast and can virtually handle any motion application, no matter how simple or complex. One of our biggest differentiators is our team of application support engineers, and that's the team that Robin is actually in, and they make sure our customers are successful with our products. For ultra-high performance, we have a multi-axis DMC4000 and 18x6. For more cost-sensitive applications, we provide the DMC41x3, the 18x2, and 21x3. All of these multi-axis controllers handle ultra-high resolution feedback and can provide servo update rates up to 32 kilohertz. They support internal, internal servo and stepper drives as well as external drives. They come as a box or card, and they have built-in digital and analog I.O. Our DMC 30000 motion controller is a compact, cost-effective solution for single-axis applications. And the Rio 47000 is a family of PLCs that are also very compact, and they're loaded with both analog and digital I.O. All of our products have built-in Ethernet connectors. They're easy to install. They're really easy to program with our two-letter English-like instruction set, and they're backed by our exceptional technical support. They're also available with very short lead times. So now after this introduction, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Robin, who will begin with the technical part of the evolution of Ethernet. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, my name is Robin Riley. I'm a senior applications engineer here at Galil. And I'm going to be going into the technical details uh, involving Ethernet as a viable motion control bus. So first, before Ethernet. Uh, before Ethernet was widely used in control systems, there were several options that people were able to, to undertake. Uh, the first was what was called bus-based communication. With bus-based communication, in essence, the controller lived within the computer. Now, that's all fine, but it had a couple of pretty significant drawbacks. First being that uh, the computer had to be relatively large to contain uh, these motion controllers, which by no means were small. The second was uh, the, uh, all the sensitive signal wires had to come out of the back of the computer. And because they were so sensitive, they needed to be relatively short before they got to their amplifiers or I.O. points. What that means is the computer actually had to be quite near these uh, potentially dirty or electrically noisy devices. So it could be quite a challenge to keep everything clean and pure and the communication and the I.O. functioning as you would expect. A second means of uh, communication before Ethernet was what was called daisy chain serial communication. Daisy chain, sorry about that. Daisy chain serial communication um, made uh, the network was in essence a series of controllers that were connected by wires from one to the next, and the master device would send out a packet. The first device would read that packet, and if it was not addressed to it, it would then echo it out onto the next device, and so on and so on. Now, that worked fine in as much as the data would eventually get to the, the node that it was addressed to. But as you can imagine, at, say, 19.2 uh, kilobaud, it was relatively slow because the data needed to be transmitted over and over until it got out to the node that it was needed. A third method was what was called RS-485 multi-drop. RS-485 allowed the data to all be received by the devices at the same time, but we were still talking about relatively slow baud rates. 
and it still took quite a long time to get the data out to the devices. R-485 multi-drop also was limited in the packet size, so the information that was being transmitted had to be relatively short. We also started uh, seeing various uh, serial communication networks that were uh, proprietary and closed, which are two terms I'm going to talk about here in a little, in a little while. Um, some examples of those would be CanOpen and DeviceNet. Uh, these, again, were very useful when the data was uh, short, repetitive, and simple. Now, these last two devices, um, as uh, the RS-485 and the serial communication protocols, sort of evolved uh, as time passed into the, the uh, communication protocols that we're uh, more familiar with today. And then lastly, as a note, um, Dalil uh, really determined that Ethernet was a viable uh, motion control bus um, approximately 1999. And so when we released our first Ethernet motion controller uh, right there, right before the 2000s, um, it really has grown into uh, most popular method of uh, uh, interfacing via the network. So a little bit more about proprietary control networks. Um, what this means is as time passed and motion control and I.O. control uh, companies um, started um, needing more sophisticated buses, they took under their own um, wing the development of these uh, control networks. Uh, they really were designed to take uh, the best possible advantage of the hardware at hand. Uh, it, they were designed to be worked only with their particular hardware. Now that's fine, but um, there was never any uh, continuity between one s solution and another. Uh, some of the points to that were um, it was a, overall a higher cost because it was a turnkey solution, so a user didn't really have access to what the information was on the network. So if there were ever networking problems, um, most likely support had to come straight out of the factory. There was really no way for end users to diagnose what could potentially be wrong with the network. And then also, as you, uh, if you were to select this proprietary network solution, you're talking about um, locking yourself into both a single hardware supplier and software supplier. So there was a very high barrier to migration if for some reason you wanted to transition to another vendor. Uh, once you were locked in, you were really uh, you were wedded for life to a certain extent. So then we started moving into uh, uh, Ethernet as a viable uh, control application. Now, outside of the world of motion control, uh, Ethernet was starting to be developed uh, by businesses and academia as a means of transferring large and complex uh, pieces of information across the network. Again, whether they were files or uh, you were computing via a mainframe, all those, inf all those large and complex uh, packets had to be transferred back and forth on uh, relatively uh, open and free networks. So Ethernet really started becoming an, alternate, an alternative to these proprietary bus uh, communication options uh, because of several reasons. Uh, the first being scalability. Uh, as we all know, with Ethernet, um, it's very easy to add or remove devices from the network without the network needing to go through a thorough reconfiguration. So it's very simple for any Ethernet users to, to add to their machine based on the requirements of the application at hand. Also, the affordability really played a large role. Um, the hardware that was selected for the Ethernet interface uh, was uh, quite cheap, quite inexpensive. Connectors were used. The cables themselves were uh, very affordable, just copper, twisted pair, uh, nothing like fiber or anything where there was just a high cost per, per linear foot of travel. Uh, the flexibility, as I mentioned, um, was of the utmost importance. Uh, because Ethernet isn't locked into uh, any particularly sized piece of information, you can transmit and receive any type of information that you require whether it's simple or complex. So the flexibility really added to uh, the overall utility of Ethernet. Multi-vendor, what I mean by that is um, because it was very well defined and anyone could use it, um, we saw it uh, proliferate very quickly out into a broad um, uh, vendor base. So really you could choose the hardware that best matched your application but still rely on Ethernet to communicate from one device to another. And then the ubiquity, uh, as we all know, uh, you really can't buy a computer without a network interface card anymore. Uh, it's just something that we're all used to, and it's a, a great benefit for us to look at Ethernet as a, as a useful means of um, controls communication. So now I want to talk a little about uh, determinism and what determinism potentially means for most control applications. Now, a non-deterministic network really allows any device on the network to transmit at any time. Um, this is because on an open network, you um, very likely could have 
many, many masters or many slaves in any combination. Uh, the network could be closed, meaning it's not connected to the outside, or it can be fully open and accessible by anyone. And most commonly, we, we uh, define that as what we call the internet. Um, because these unaffiliated devices could theoretically talk at any time, there's always a possibility that collisions can occur. Now, if collisions occur, um, the, the protocol is being used to demand that the devices that send the data retransmit that information. An example of a protocol in a non-deterministic network would be called TCPIP, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. Um, but it really, these non-deterministic networks were designed to be able to handle a diverse variety of possible configurations. So it could be a small network, a large network, an open network. You could be transmitting simple information. You could be transmitting complex information. All those things could be occurring at the same time. The non-deterministic networks allow that. Now, on the other hand, a deterministic network uh, is basically completely closed, and there is a particular slice of time on the network given to each device. So what that means is there is this guaranteed same time delay for data transfer from one device to another. Um, deterministic network typically has one master and many slaves. I've seen it done in other ways. But um, for sure, the, the majority of these deterministic networks rely on one device transmitting and a bunch of slaves uh, receiving and acting on that information one at a time. Now, one important thing about uh, deterministic networks is if some device, whether it's at the master or one of the slaves, has nothing to say, then the time when it comes up uh, to transmit their, their information, uh, the network goes dark, and uh, any, any bandwidth for that moment is lost. So uh, some examples of protocols in a deterministic network are going to be items like CanOpen and Ethercat. And I'll get into both of those here in a minute. So the question really is, is non-determinism relevant for your motion control application? Um, as I mentioned, collisions could occur uh, if there are two devices transmitting at the same time. And so the question is, are collisions likely to cause problematic delays for control systems? Uh, just a real quick example, assuming a, a 100 megabit wire speed, a fairly, a fairly complex uh, chunk of information, 100 bits of data, would be transmit with a total time of 8 microseconds. Um, now, for the most part, um, and I'll get into this in another slide as well, um, motion control networks need to be on closed networks, meaning no outside access. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is the security of the network, but also just the ability of the engineer to control the traffic on this, this uh, very important network. Um, one comment I have about collisions is unless you're running at a uh, near full throttle on a, on a network, using most of the bandwidth that's available. Uh, collisions are rare, even on open networks. Uh, so this is like, uh, already it's fairly uncommon. But when we start talking about closed networks, collisions effectively uh, disappear from our uh, realm of concern. So uh, whether or not um, the determinism is relevant to your application comes down to the question of what data are you sharing on this network. Uh, if you're sharing things like high-end motion commands, or maybe uh, status updates, things along those lines. Um, even with this example showing uh, approximately eight microsecond time on the wire, um, you've got many, many milliseconds before the, the information could be considered late. Now, there is some data that um, you would potentially want to um, uh, transmit on a deterministic network. For example, if you were closing a servo loop uh, across the wire, it's very important for that information to arrive at exactly the same time every single time. Now, um, in some situations, that's going to be the case. But with most, most Galil products, the uh, servo loop is done locally inside the processor of the controller. So there is no need for that deterministic uh, timestamp servo information coming across the network. And so that's one reason why, in most cases, we don't see a uh, deterministic network as vital to the success of your motion application. Now, one other uh, quick comment is um, sort of a, the fact that deterministic networks do not equal fast networks. Again, because uh, it's very likely that some devices won't have any information to say when it's their turn to talk, the overall throughput of a deterministic network tends to be less than an open and dynamic uh, non-deterministic network. 
All right, now I'm going to start talking about a couple of the protocols that get used and how they eventually relate to uh, Galil and motion control in general. Uh, the first is going to be UDP IP, which is short for User Datagram Protocol. Uh, this is certainly the simplest uh, means of Ethernet communication, but um, just by its very simplicity, it's still considered a very useful uh, protocol to be used. First comment on that is going to be the fact that there's no connection establishment meaning there's very little handshaking between a master and slave when the, when the connection is made. Um, this allows uh, for both fast connection and also a fast recovery if for some, some reason something went wrong. Another comment is that the receiver doesn't acknowledge the receipts, unlike uh, TCP, which I'll talk about in a minute. After every um, packet comes in with UDP IP, it's just assumed that the slave got the packet. Uh, it doesn't transmit any sort of acknowledgement that it received the packet or that it's ready for the next packet. So what that means is there are overall fewer packets on the network, and that overall allows for an increase in the throughput of actual data on a given uh, network with a given amount of bandwidth. UDP IP is also used for uh, multicast and broadcast, where many devices need to get uh, identical information at the same time. Uh, that's not... Uh, allowed on uh, things like TCP IP, where there's only a one master to slave relationship. Uh, what I mean by no connection state is, again, it's if, some, if there's some error on the network or even if the cable is cut, the master doesn't necessarily know that there is a problem with the data communication. Now, it's definitely true that both the master and the slave could be programmed to react to the loss of packet information, maybe by sharing a uh, time-stamped heartbeat so every 100 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or whatnot, the master could transmit this timestamp heartbeat. And if for some reason the slave didn't see uh, the heartbeat change in X number of milliseconds, it could react. It could close its handle. It could drive itself to a safe place, whatever is the most safe and appropriate thing for the machine to do. So again, there is no connection state built into UDP IP, but it can be programmed. the devices can be programmed to react to the loss of connection. Uh, UDP IP is definitely considered suitable for closed networks. Again, with closed networks, there is no unexpected uh, and random traffic that would appear on these networks. Uh, with closed networks, again, it's assumed that the, the engineer has complete control over what data is present on that network. And then, again, because of the lack of receipts of packets, um, you're able to get greater throughput and overall uh, use more of the network's bandwidth for transmitting actual um, motion data. Now, the more common um, UDP or transmission protocol we're talking about is TCP IP. Uh, that's very familiar to any users of the internet, um, mostly because of its ability to handle these open networks. So first, uh, TCP IP guarantees that the data arrives in the correct order. Obviously, if you're streaming video or uh, listening to music, it makes no sense if the uh, information arrives all jumbled up. So TCP IP guarantees that you get the packets in the order they were transmitted. Uh, TCP IP only has one master and one slave, or one transmitter and one receiver. Um, this means you can't broadcast or multicast like you could uh, with a UDP IP link. Now, for every packet received, the slave acknowledgement acknowledges back to the master that this, this packet has been accepted and is legitimate and has no errors. So that assures that there's going to be no lost packets. But again, uh, if we're talking about controls networks, which are something that there's sensitive devices and potentially dangerous machinery involved, doesn't have outside access. So if you're losing packets, it's not because hopefully there's uh, not enough bandwidth on the, on the machine but rather it's an engineering problem. Maybe it's electrical noise, maybe it's a loose connection, something that could be uh, potentially solved. So um, having the lack of acknowledgments on a closed network isn't as important as it would be, again, on something open like the Internet. Uh, TCP IP also provides for what's called congestion control. Congestion control involves, uh, again, with open networks, uh, we would all think that um, uh, network carriers want to maximize their uh, capital expenditures, so they don't necessarily supply uh, infinite amounts of bandwidth. They deliberately uh, allow only a certain amount of network traffic to occur at any given time. Otherwise, they'd have to buy that many more routers and switches and copper wire, et cetera. So um, by TCP IP providing congestion control on these open networks, 
uh, it allows hundreds if not thousands of users to not lose data although just as a as a group everyone's going to see a slowdown in the overall network performance but when that relates to uh, closed um, safe motion control networks that really doesn't play a large role uh, again we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of users all trying to check their email all at once uh, rather control networks uh, have very specific uh, vital information that to get transmitted between these various motion devices. So in summary, uh, TCPIP is uh, very suitable for these open networks or even very large closed networks. And what I mean by large closed networks is maybe it's a, a complete factory automation system where there's many, many hundreds of meters between devices, maybe hundreds of users, maybe thousands of uh, various devices all on uh, a single network. Where there is heavy amounts of traffic, there are uh, many switches and routers in place. Uh, there is the possibility of electrical noise. Uh, TCP/IP may still be a better choice than UDP on those sorts of networks. So this slide, real briefly, uh, describes what happens when a uh, Ethernet packet arrives and, and works its way up uh, through the protocol stack. So in essence, uh, each of the the layers uh, read what's in the packet and strip away uh, the information surrounding it. So it's like you're just working your way down towards a mailing address. Uh, so as it comes in, the Ethernet driver then strips it out, determines its uh, internet protocol. At that point, it determines it's a UDP packet or a TCP packet. It routes it in the appropriate way and strips off the addressing information. Now this in general, this process is called demultiplexing. And it's important because as we'll see in a minute, um, some of the more sophisticated protocols that get used use the same demultiplexing effect. They just contain additional layers of uh, address information within these data packets. So now I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, some of Galil's Ethernet options that are available. Uh, the first being ASCII over UDP IP, or just basically text strings uh, to and fro a Galil device via the UDP protocol. Uh, same uh, with ASCII over TCP IP. I'm going to start talking a little bit more about uh, what's known as Modbus TCP, as well as a couple of new, newer players such as Ethernet IP. And then finally, I'm going to start uh, introducing uh, the EtherCAT solution that Galil is beginning to offer. Now, each of those um, is viable. Uh, some of them are older than others. But all of them continue to play a role in motion control applications that we see today. Uh, each of them have pros and cons, so none of them can be discounted outright as uh, no longer viable in these motion control solutions. So first up is ASCII over UDP IP. Again, uh, probably the simplest potential solution. Uh, you'll see here in the chart at the bottom of the slide, again, um, the IP datagram containing within it the UDP datagram, and in that datagram is the actual UDP data. So uh, one of the beautiful things about ASCII over UDP is it can be managed without any proprietary software whatsoever. So it's just as simple as opening the UDP link, sending a, a string of characters. In, uh, in the Galil's world, that string of characters is followed by a character turn line feed. That to the controller is recognized as a valid command and is acted upon. So there's no need for any third-party software or even proprietary software from the motion control vendor. Uh, we do consider it suitable for most control, uh, closed control networks. Again, UDP IP is a fine choice uh, as long as the network traffic is well understood and uh, well managed by the engineer. Uh, so as long as that's the case and you don't have a need for any of the, uh, the packet receipt or acknowledgments of TCP, uh, there's no reason to believe that um, the ASCII over UDP isn't a, a viable s solution for most control networks. Um, in fact, we uh, consider UDP IP still so reliable that um, it was selected as the default communication protocol for the current generation of Galil software, which is called Galil Suite. Um, applications uh, for ASCII over UDP could be anything from a simple uh, one master, one slave, closed uh, machine, it's just slow in the next slide, or other items where maybe the data isn't um, uh, time critical, such as uh, streaming, buffered motion commands, uh, visual status indicators may be used by the operator, or even um, more deterministic uh, data acquisition methods uh, where you do need things uh, in a very reliable manner. So here's an example machine. Uh, it's a five-axis grinding machine. Um, in it, we'll see that there is a uh, what's called an HMI, or human-machine interface. 
Uh, it's basically just a glorified screen with a, a computer built into the back of it. This allows the operator to interact with the machine by maybe sending recipes, uh, maybe uh, tolerances, selecting uh, how many items to run for the day, uh, just sort of the high-level commands that the operator might need to send to the controller. Now I show over here that basically there's going to be a single Ethernet cable from this HMI over into the motion controller. <coughs> Excuse me. And on this uh, Ethernet link, I'm going to be transmitting and receiving uh, specific types of information. The motion controller itself is connected to the motors, uh, the feedback devices from the machine, as well as all the inputs and outputs, whether they're digital or analog. Uh, those all route into the motion controller. So this UDP IP link here um, will be transmitting from the HMI uh, buffered uh, position data, and what we call this in the Lil world is called contour mode, and that's basically delta position, delta time. So I tell the motors move, say, five counts in the next four milliseconds, and now move ten counts in the next four milliseconds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the controller then responds with a couple pieces of information to the, to the HMI, for example, buffer depth. So you as a programmer gets to choose do I have a very narrow buffer, so only maybe 20 or 40 milliseconds worth of information stored in the controller, such that uh, the, the motion can stop or be adjusted pretty much on the fly? Or do I have a very deep buffer where the controller is given all the commands for a given profile, and then the line goes dark until the motion is complete? Again, that's all user programmable. Um, I also have it shown uh, that the, the I.O. and maybe position information is fed back into the HMI. And again, that information would be scaled and presented to the operator in terms of engineering units on that screen. So this is a very valid, straightforward method of uh, communicating between a single device and a single slave. Obviously, it's completely closed network, and there is no unexpected packet traffic. Uh, so there's really no concern whatsoever about uh, losing any information between the two devices. The next example I have for us is ASCII over TCP IP. So this is, again, just sending and receiving ASCII strings. And with the Galil, again, the character and line feed is enough for us to recognize that that's the completion of a command and we should act. The great benefit of ASCII over TCP IP is that, um, again, you don't need any proprietary software. So you can run with something as simple as a telnet session or even socket-based communication, uh, be it through Windows, Linux, it almost doesn't matter. You can use any exotic uh, uh, operating system that you might require. Uh, this gives great flexibility to the programmer because you're not locked into a particular set of drivers or to a particular vendor and uh, having to manage their software for the life of the machine. Now, ASCII over TCP is uh, appropriate for, say, complex control networks. Maybe there's many, many control devices in a relatively large area where maybe it's electrically noisy, maybe there's a possibility of broken wires or loose connections, um, things that might complicate what before was a completely closed sealed ecosystem, like that machine I showed you where it's just one master, one slave. Uh, ASCII over TCP IP is also legitimate for uh, running on an open network. Now, open networks are something that uh, Galil does not necessarily recommend our users to use. Um, as some of us learned many, many years ago, uh, the Stuxnet virus really showed that um, controls networks have no place being on an open network because there's always the possibility of unauthorized access. And again, we're moving motors and, and you know, opening and closing valves, and there's lots of expensive and dangerous machinery involved. So uh, really no outside access is, should be allowed uh, just for the very safety of uh, man and machine. Um, but nonetheless, uh, TCP IP does allow uh, users to program Galil controllers uh, on open networks. Um, TCP IP is still considered a, a viable uh, networking architecture. In fact, uh, even today, uh, ASCII over TCP IP is, con is the default protocol for the Galil Tools uh, API toolkit. So we can continue to use it. Uh, we use it every day. Um, it's certainly not going anywhere in the near future. So here's just a graphical example of uh, su uh, successful uh, communication between uh, master and controller uh, via TCP IP over Ethernet. Uh, what I have here is a DMC 4000 series controller uh, commanding a Copley digital amplifier, which is driving a Schneebier linear stage. Um, this solution, uh, the, the goal was uh, to send a command 
to move the motor, to settle the motor, and tell the host that the motion was completed in the shortest possible period of time. And what we can see here in uh, the best case scenario, when we're commanded to move a thousandth of an inch, the Galil was able to receive the command, move the motor, settle, and alert the host PC in 1.7 milliseconds. So that was even with the TCP IP overhead of acknowledging the receipt of the packets and transmitting when the, the uh, motion had completed. Now we did sort of uh, tilt the scales in our favor, um, quite simply because this was the only communication that was going on on 100 meg megabit Ethernet. Uh, so there were very, very few packets, the, you know, less than 1% of the bandwidth of the network was being used. So we were really in no danger of, um, of using what TCP IP gives us, which is error and, uh, and uh, congestion control. But nonetheless, uh, this example does show that uh, it's very uh, capable of transmitting and receiving information and um, getting that information out in a very timely manner. So now we're going to go a little bit deeper down this family tree here and talk about Modbus TCP. Again, you see in the bottom, I have uh, the demultiplexing um, diagrams. Again, uh, we're just using the various uh, data chunks to store more and more uh, addressing information. So for Modbus TCP, um, it's a very well-defined format that lives within the TCP packet. Uh, it's typically used for sharing uh, states of digital analog I.O as well as uh, transmitting and receiving uh, array data. Now that array data could be whatever the user requires. As long as you make up a, a map of what that information entails, uh, you can, it's a very open and flexible architecture for transmitting and receiving information uh, from multiple vendors. So it's a nice way to interface uh, these various third-party devices without having to learn uh, many, many different programming languages. It does have strong multi-vendor support. I see a fair number of uh, motion control and I.O. control devices continuing to offer uh, Modbus as an option. Um, a benefit of using Modbus uh, I.O. devices within the GLIL universe is that once the Modbus connection is established, uh, the user only needs to send and receive commands via the same GLIL language that you're used to. So again, no need to learn multiple programming codes you just reuse the GLIL language as, as is well described. So here's a typical Modbus TCP application. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a, an automated uh, bodily and sealing application. So what I have here on the left-hand side is, uh, again, a little touch screen, an HMI. Uh, that's the user interface. And in that is going to be uh, the ability to uh, set recipes, set the speed, maybe the, the number of bottles to be uh, accessed pretty much the, uh, the user interface to the entire machine. On the right-hand side, I show uh, Galil's uh, Pocket PLC RIO remote I.O. device, which in this case handled a fair number of digital and analog I.O. It did contain, or it does contain an application program, um, but nonetheless, uh, it does transmit and receive that I.O. state via the Modbus protocol back into the center device, which is the motion controller. The motion controller um, does all the high-performance, uh, deterministic, closed-loop uh, motor control, as well as monitoring a high-speed registration mark and camming these axes based on the receipt of that registration point. So uh, again, via the Modbus protocol, uh, array information is transmitted from the HMI and stored within the controller. That, uh, that contains the high-level information about how many bottles to, to process, how fast the line is running, et cetera. And then these, the high I.O. count is all contained within this um, remote I.O., but is controlled overall uh, via the motion controller. Now, I do show a link over here to the to outside of the machine. In this case, uh, maybe this is a factory uh, plant automation software. Now, the physical link shows that it's connected into this the remote I.O., but really this just acts as a hub. The actual Ethernet link is back into the controller. So at any given time, this controller maintains a Modbus link to the HMI, Modbus link to the PLC, as well as, uh, in this example, uh, just a standard ASCII over TCP IP link to the, up, the upstream plant supervisor. Next up, I want to talk a little about um, Ethernet IP. Uh, Ethernet IP was, again, uh, developed on the TCP IP protocol and was uh, developed to be compatible within several proprietary control systems. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, this really uh, allows multiple vendors to share uh, I.O. commands and, uh, again, array information based on this fairly well-defined information contained within the TCP packet. Uh, Galil offers the Ethernet IP as an available uh, option for controls, so if anyone has any questions, they should get in touch with a Galil engineer. Um, here's an example of the Ethernet IP application that I'd like to talk about. Uh, in this case, it's factory core automation. Uh, what I have here is a PLC that um, maintains and establishes up to um, connection with 10 DMC 4040s at any given time. So each of these is programmed to run effectively autonomously, but reporting back to the PLC as necessary. Um, the, the information here was that the PLC would come, would send out information within the packet with target positions necessary for each of these devices, and then report back uh, when that when that uh, motor had been put into position. In this application, they also used several of our RIO PLCs to uh, handle IO that was not. Uh, intimately related to the motion applications. So all these devices all link back into the one PLC and maintained uh, these Ethernet IP links in order to transmit and receive the information. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about EtherCAT, which is uh, sort of the newest uh, kid on the block as far as uh, uh, motion control protocols go. It is what we know as a deterministic protocol and it was based on the old style uh, can open interface which was uh, very, very common all through the 80s and then uh, sort of went by the wayside for a while until uh, 100 megabit and gigabit Ethernet allowed for much higher speeds and much better bandwidth. It is built on the Ethernet physical layer, so it's the same um, RJ45 connector that we're all used to. Uh, it is designed to ensure a reliable server loop closure over the network. Again, because it's deterministic, you know that there's always going to be X number of milliseconds between the arrival of each individual packet. Uh, because you have this very highly reliable server loop closure, um, not only is closed network recommended, it's actually absolutely required. Otherwise, if there's any uh, unauthorized or unexpected traffic on the network, uh, the deterministic of the EtherCAT uh, data stream is, is thrown out the window. Now, what Galil offers uh, today is uh, the EtherCAT as a master for motion applications. So we're able to command remote drives and, and motors uh, as if they were local. So that's got several benefits um, to users, which I'm going to go, go into in, in, a, in a minute. But most importantly to the programmer is these EtherCAT slave uh, axes are commanded in the exact same way as a, a local axis. So there is no, no change in the way, in the architecture of the command line, which that a user would need to, to spend time on learning. Here's an example of an EtherCAT application. In this case, it's a it's large, a physically large metal fabrication application. <coughs> the EtherCAT uh, axes physically quite distant from the main motion controller and the host PC. In this case, it was a large pieces of metal that needed to be moved uh, under a drilling mechanism, and so obviously the metal is uh, it's not deformable, and you need very high accuracy in order to allow the drill to position the holes where they need to be. So um, in this case, we're using a DMC-4000. And you'll see I have two motors connected directly to the motion controller. These two motors handle the drilling head. And then I connect via this EtherCAT link over to two EtherCAT slaves. In this case, there's going to be one Yaskawa drive and one AMC drive. These were the motors that ended up uh, positioning the uh, large metal device under the drill head while still being fairly distant from that actual drill head. And then in this case, there's also a standard ASCII over TCP link back up to a host PC. So the controller is responsible for maintaining both this EtherCAT link to the slaves as well as to the master. And again, it's very important to realize that these axes are coordinated as if local, so the user doesn't have to worry about um, commanding these motors any differently than it does anything else. So briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about um, what we can expect uh, in 2015 and beyond. Uh, the first being uh, what comes up um, with gigabit, uh, 1,000 megabit, if you will, Ethernet and beyond, because that's something that uh, uh, various manufacturers are pushing as sort of the next great thing. Now, naturally, at gigabit and beyond, uh, you have huge amounts of bandwidth, high, 
incredible amounts of data can be transmitted and received. Uh, for the most part, um, that was developed for the users uh, where they need, say, high-definition video, streaming music, uh, cloud-based computing for, for uh, companies, things where there really is vast amounts of information that need to be transmitted and received. With motion applications, we're still talking about fairly simple, fairly short, uh, and fairly regular packets that don't really require such a high amount of bandwidth. But nonetheless, uh, the little controllers are going to have to be uh, able to be maintained on these gigabit networks with all this additional traffic to, to handle. The next item we see as uh, coming up more in the future of Ethernet controllers is uh, uh, wireless. Now, we all have Wi-Fi on our laptop. And the question is whether or not Wi-Fi is ever going to be safe enough or secure enough to run these uh, system critical and, uh, again, uh, potentially dangerous motion control applications. As of right now, Galil doesn't see wireless as 100% secure, so we continue to not recommend it as a uh, fundamentally safe um, uh, protocol to be used for these controls networks. But maybe at some point as uh, time passes and we do more internet banking, and more uh, internet-based uh, private phone calls, et cetera, uh, wireless may become something that is considered safe enough to run on these control networks. Not yet, but maybe sometime in the future. Now, the next item to talk about is what's sort of the buzzword of the Internet of Things. And that's where your refrigerator recognizes that you're low on milk, and so it ends up emailing the grocery store your, uh, your grocery list, which is then de delivered by drone you know, two to three hours later. So this Internet of Things, what that's going to lead to is just an explosion of number of devices that potentially have Internet or Ethernet addresses and uh, put uh, traffic out on networks. So that's going to uh, be both useful for motion control as well as detrimental. We're really just going to have to see uh, how this evolves and whether that information is going to be something that motion controllers ever have uh, exposure to on these control networks. Another thing we're going to see is continued attempt at standardization of protocols such that anything can identify itself and run anywhere. Uh, we're all quite used to being able to walk into a coffee shop, put, turning on your laptop, and being connected to the network in a matter of seconds. And so uh, we can only see more and more efforts by um, various networking companies to make that process even simpler. So by that, uh, by that occurring, uh, the question is whether or not that simplification of connectivity is going to lead to problems where connectivity might want to be restricted. So we're going to have to watch carefully to see um, as time passes whether this uh, ease of use leads to an overall um, debilitation of these, again, very sensitive and complex control networks. And the last point I want to talk about is what we would consider smart sensors. Uh, smart sensors are things where uh, maybe it's a sensitive signal, maybe it's a potentiometer, accelerometer, temperature sensor, et cetera, that, uh, reads information and gets that information back to uh, another device in digital form. Now, of course, a PLC could do all those things and transmit that information, but that's a fairly high cost to get uh, what could be uh, you know, coming out of a 30-cent thermocouple. But what we're seeing now is the development of these smart sensors that might only measure one thing, but then have network access to transmit that up to a host. Um, as time passes and things become more affordable, we're going to start seeing these uh, individual sensors come down to a dollar a sensor with network interface. So the controller can then uh, will have the need to interface with 10, if not hundreds, of these smart sensors uh, and still retain all that uh, those network connections, but with the great benefit of not having to send these sensitive signal wires uh, great distances or even um, organizing all these sensors to route into a fairly complex and expensive PLC before it makes it up to the motion control system. So again, smart sensors are something that as they come online, uh, Galil and all other motion control vendors are going to have to uh, really analyze the protocols being used and how to retain um, many, many network connections in a reliable fashion. So now, real briefly in summary, I just wanted to mention um, that in the motion control world, uh, the flexibility and configurability of Ethernet um, really allows for a, a nice, high-performance, vendor-neutral vendor means of communication between these devices, whether that's on a one-on-one -on -one basis or broadcasting from multiple devices to multiple slaves. 
uh, the flexibility really allows um, the engineer to program their, their networks in a manner that uh, best suits the machines. Uh, we see Ethernet as uh, continuing to be an effective means of this transmission and receipt of information, and we uh, certainly expect uh, Ethernet to continue to be uh, the control protocol of choice for the variety of our users. So again, uh, thank you for your time uh, at this point. Uh, if we have any questions, I'd be uh, happy to take anyone uh, uh, who writes in. Thank you, Robin. We have a few questions that I think we have time to get to. Um, let's start with how many Galil motion controllers and PLCs can be on a network? OK. Really, the, um, the short answer is an infinite number of controllers could be on a, a network. Um, as the, the network complexity increases, again, we start to talk about the need for having closed architecture and well-managed data. So uh, the engineer's um, job becomes a little more complicated because you're potentially having, um, again, multiple masters and multiple slaves. There is a possibility of organizing the network such that there is only ever one host that transmits and receives to dozens, if not hundreds, of ver various uh, nodes and slaves. So really, the short answer is infinite. But as the uh, complexity of the network increases, the, the job of the engineer becomes more difficult to retain uh, the appropriate amount of network traffic. OK, we have another question. It says, I see you have an EtherCAT master controller in your product line. Can you give some details about this? OK, well, so far, um, the EtherCAT solution is, um, is effectively uh, we're, we're just coming out with this solution. As I mentioned, uh, we're controlling a couple of uh, various third-party amplifiers, and we're looking to increase that list as time passes. As of right now, um, we're, we're talking about uh, running in what's called cyclic torque mode, where we're sending out torque commands to the various uh, EtherCAT slaves. The slaves are then uh, returning their position information, and we're closing that servo loop uh, across the network. So. Uh, right now, we're talking about cyclic torque mode, and as time passes, we're going to be able to see uh, additional modes of motion and additional third-party EtherCAT uh, amplifiers come online as a viable solution. Uh, how physically long can cables be in an Ethernet network without degrading performance? Hmm, good question. So um, without a doubt, without batting an eye, I would say 50 to 100 feet is no problem in even noisy and uh, complex environments. Uh, if we're talking about an office network with sort of a minimum amount of electrical noise, uh, two, four, five hundred feet isn't really going to be a problem. It's only when we start talking about uh, electrically and physically dirty environments where there's potential of loss of packets, might you need to use a system where there's uh, routers or switches every hundred meters or so to, uh, to, to boost the signal and repeat it uh, to avoid any lost packets. Now, that all being said, 99.99% of um, Ethernet or uh, motion applications are contained within, say, a 10-meter space. So uh, having physically long cables uh, is, is certainly feasible, but really only plays a role in uh, very few of the applications that we end up seeing. OK. Uh, do you believe a non-deterministic network works as well as a deterministic network for control systems? Uh, I do, because the uh, motion, the Galil solution involves, for the most part, closing the, the, the time critical information internally to the processor of the motion controller. There is no transmission and receipt of this uh, vital sub millisecond information on the network. So just as I mentioned in that uh, grinding application, the host computer is responsible for um, buffer depth. So whether it's a, uh, 2 milliseconds worth of information or 200 milliseconds worth of information, <coughs> the user gets to choose um, how, how long could go by before the machine uh, would have to react to the loss of connection. So again, if the axes are all closed locally, then being on a non-deterministic network is entirely su suitable. But um, part and parcel to that is the fact that closed networks, because there is no unexpected traffic, should be considered uh, deterministic networks. There really is no traffic that's unexpected and could potentially interrupt uh, 
this information, whether it is time critical or less time critical, like it would be if they were just high-level motion commands. So, yeah, non-deterministic networks uh, for motion controls are, are perfectly adequate. Certain cases, such as EFACAT, do require this uh, this uh, time critical uh, sliced up uh, network, but uh, that's only in the cases where you are closing these servo loops uh, over the, the actual uh, network bus. Okay, I think we have time for uh, just one more question, and I'll just remind everyone if if you did submit a question and we haven't got to it um, because we're running short on time, um, the panelists will be able to contact you after the webinar um, to, an to follow up with you and answer your questions. So um, for our last question, um, it says, uh, since UDP IP is used for multicasts and broadcasts and doesn't acknowledge receipts, uh, why would you use it over TCP IP in a control system architecture? Mm -hmm. Well, as I alluded to in a couple of my slides, um, TCP IP is still um, necessary in certain situations, maybe because there's just a vast number of devices on the network, which although is closed, the, um, the traffic going back and forth is complicated enough that uh, you wanted that additional security blanket of having uh, the acknowledgments coming in from the TCP. Uh, one of the slides I showed had a, a very simple network, uh, just a one master, one slave running TCP IP, we're still talking about um, less than two milliseconds, not only to transmit and receive the information, but actually do the move as well. So the benefit of the broadcast and multicast via UDP is something that um, may or may not play a role. Maybe you just simply have never have a need for multiple devices to all act at a, at, on a given piece of information. Or maybe TCP is more suitable because it's physically distant and there's other information that potentially could impact the the, um, the quality of the, the data being transmitted. So really both are viable and if there's any questions in anyone's minds, um, the little engineers are more than happy to consult to determine which protocol is, is best for the application at hand. Okay. Thank you very much Robin and Ann for um, presenting this very informative webinar for us today. Thank you to all the attendees that, that have called in to listen, and I want to definitely thank our sponsors, Electromate and Galil Motion Control. Um, just as a quick reminder, the webinar has been recorded, and an email with the link to the recording will be sent to you um, shortly. It usually takes about 24 hours or less. Um, and again, just want to remind everyone, we do have um, some other upcoming webinars that you can find on uh, motioncontrolonline.org. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.